Hello and welcome to Extreme Perspectives. This is a monthly podcast created by The Sense Network to bring you conversations with people who see things differently and think differently. This podcast is for people who want to expand their mind and develop their creative intelligence. I'm your host, Jeremy Brown. For 20 years, I've been seeking out people from the edges of culture, the creators, outliers, misfits, rebels, and the crazy ones, people who want to change things and push the human race forward. Today, we're speaking with outlier, storyteller, child of earth, and vegan chef, Joel Brevet. In this mind-expanding conversation, we dive into the concept of Lagom, the commoditization of human nature, and how the Cavendish banana epitomizes a world lacking empathy. Hi, Joel. Hi, Jeremy. I'm, I am so pleased that we've got some time to have a conversation today. I think this has the potential to be the longest podcast. I think I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to get it. I'm just going to get some flattery in to start with. I think, I think you're a remarkable and extraordinary person. And I'm really looking forward to, for our conversation, being able to share our conversation um, with, with more people in the Sense Network and beyond today. But as you know, how we always get these conversations started is, is with my question, are you an outlier, a misfit, a rebel, or a crazy one? Well, first of all, thank you for the lovely introduction. I feel honoured that you're uh, giving my waffle been the longest podcast, <laughs> the longest episode, giving it uh, some credence. But uh, to that question, I've kind of been giving it some thought. And actually, I think there should be another option or all of the above. I think that could be all of the above. But I would say largely how I've become all of the above is by starting as an outlier. And I think that what happens as an outlier, just briefly, is by not being privy to the stories of everybody else at the camp, you end up making up your own. And as you start making up your own, or you start looking from the outside, seeing the wood for the trees while everybody else is in it, you start to develop a new, I suppose, a mental paradigm, a new spiritual paradigm. And from there, that connection you use with nature, with everything else, and you start to tell your own stories and see how they fit in. But I think being an outlier has definitely rewarded me in my life. I love that because that reminds me of an expression that I heard many years ago. I think it was from a theatre director, storyteller, and she said, if you have no story, you have no place at the fire. So I think, yeah, that's how you go from being an outlier and coming in and, and, and telling your story. I think to try and introduce you is difficult, and that could take a long time because I think you have a pretty broad spectrum of experiences, but it would be fantastic if you could just provide a few clues to the listeners of the sort of different spaces you've been involved in and and then we could maybe talk a little bit more about the sort of the the journey that you've been on sure like yeah some anecdotal highlights well you're right that i think when you know at dinner parties and someone says what do you do it's a, one of those questions that actually can like you know leave me quite flummoxed and in, instead i'll normally give some kind of pithy or comical answer because it is a life well lived I think and it's hard to encapsulate in uh, a quantitative sentence that will please someone trying to make an assessment of where you fit in their social hierarchy <laughs> and so uh, I would think so before I start talking about those different things I would like to say that one thing that I believe has connected everything that I have you know uh, put my life forward to and committed to has been a connection with people, with others, and then more later in my career with everything as well, with the natural environment as much as with other people. Empathy, I think, has been a large driving uh, value through my life and trying to see stories through the eyes of others. And again, back to that first point, is that when you feel that you're not invited to other people's stories, you kind of spend a lot of time trying to understand them, to understand why is this story not for me? Why am I not part of your story? And that measuring yourself against other people's stories. And so I think it's actually a key to empathy is taking that deep dive into understanding other people to better understand yourself. But to that point, yes, I, across my life now, like, I mean, it began, I, I studied, I went to university to do uh, accountancy and finance in Leeds, uh, back at the turn of uh, the millennium right now, again, given away my age. But then I actually turned that into becoming a bar owner. And at the point in time, I was one of the youngest bar owners in the UK. Channel 4 actually ended up commissioning and making a TV programme uh, called The Hustlers, of which I was one of the episodes. My episode's called On The Rocks as a barman. So I was a 
the hustler on the rocks. Uh, and really interesting period of life because uh, I've kind of grown up, I think I feel quite religiously. I'd moved denomination quite a few times, all still within Christianity, but I'd been a Baptist, Catholic, Seventh-day Adventist. And so I'd kind of taken a real long, hard look at myself through the, a biblical lens. And at that point in my life, I kind of, I feel I'd conflated religion and spirituality. And I felt that my knowledge of the Bible, the ability to quote from it was like a testament to how spiritual I was. But then, uh, funnily enough, yeah, as a bar owner, it's a different kind of spirits that ended up uh, speaking tongues through me. Uh, those spirits being, yeah, gin, vodka, uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, my my like yeah, but as uh, as Will Smith would say, my life got flipped, turned upside down. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as a bar owner and as somebody who is now involved in nightlife, it was a different way of connecting with people. But I felt at the time, you know, in my early 20s, that being able to provide people with fun party entertainment was, you know, uh, like key to empathy, key to connecting with people. But I actually took a conversation with my mum who kind of pointed out that, like, you know, what is it about that environment that is bonding people? Is it positivity and progression? Or is it, like, you know, some drink to remember, some drink to forget? kind of thing so that was an interesting period but I mean again I learned a lot but I mean yeah like uh, whistle stop touring through I ended up being a girl band manager putting a girl band together myself uh, taking a girl band from like yeah girls that we long before uh, pop idol and these shows were really big doing the auditioning lots of different people all up and down the country making a band uh, a band like you know we never made it to you know, superstardom. I mean, we made it to have been like Vodafone's one to watch of 2008, 2009, which was great. Got to do a small UK tour, did some music with Eric Prids, someone who actually still, like, you know, I, I really respect him as an artist and his music. So had some like great moments in that. But then on from there, ended up being a gallerist and then uh, an art dealer before becoming a newspaper founder, before getting back involved in human rights activism helping people with startups, uh, community management stuff and work uh, in places like WeWork and other community spaces. And then in the last what, five, six years, I went vegan. I, I, I think a culmination of like, you know, empathy, other conversations I've been having during my life kind of yeah, crystallized for me. And I recognized that I needed to have a more responsible and intersectional outlook on the things that matter to me. I started a vegan journey and yeah, five, six years in, that has now framed a lot of the stuff that I uh, am currently involved in from global agricultural bioremediation projects to helping people with copywriting for uh, regenerative uh, renaissance projects and I suppose now a lot in the web three and the uh, regenerative finance space so yeah and um, you've also had a YouTube hit yes so uh, my vegan story uh, how it kind of got from just somebody choosing to like you know adopt a new lifestyle going vegan and me now being this kind of like voice in the, the vegan space in the regenerative space in the green sustainability space uh is actually largely i would say down to in 2017 i made a parody of stormzy's song shut up and i called it vegan shut up it is available on spotify uh, on Apple Music, all good music platforms, and on YouTube as well. It was one of the most fun experiences making that music video and that that kind of whole song. And again, actually, when I consider that, I must have spent like under a hundred pounds in total in putting it together for something which ended up having over two and a half million views and over thirty million global impressions and engagements. Like it was a testament again to you know if you have a good message and you have a positive way of sharing it. You don't need to use the nefarious, like, you know, algorithmic background to get your message out. Actually, sometimes it can travel with goodwill and with people thinking, you know what, I like what you yep. have to say here. Yeah, I would I would say to anybody, like, check it out, make your own uh, assessment. But yeah, I'm still smiling five years later. Yeah, no, I'm a firm believer in that as well. That's the power of a, a, a good idea. It should travel and the advocacy will do the hard work for you. You've already in our short conversation, you've mentioned empathy a number of times. I'd love to dig into that because this is a word we hear a lot now. And certainly in our work, we, you know, when we're thinking about the future, designing new products, empathy is a key skill. We know this, you know, we, we you know, as we talk about IQ and there's the emotional intelligence, that's part of the 
empathy piece sits sits within there you know we're, we're moving that on now to talk about from iq to eq to cq which is creative intelligence whereas where all of this starts to ladder up but i know it's it's clear that empathy is important for you and i know that you've done quite a bit of work around this you've got some models and i'd love to explore that a little bit with you and just understand more i don't know a lot but it would be great if you could give us an introduction to that idea my life terrain has very much been a kind of like latitudinal research terrain now i've just kind of like you know uh, at different points of my life kind of stopped to take stock and look at why have things are like you know ended up playing out the way that they have and like what could i have done more how could other like factors have like played in to make those scenarios different and again this isn't like you know better or worse it's different and kind of just trying to understand my social ecosystems. But I think that like where you take an ecosystem or holistic approach to, to, to thinking, to, to problem solving, to anything, you kind of end up almost organically like moving towards a, 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 an empathetic uh, mindset. And the reason why I would say that is because in one of the models that I've created, like my empathic framework, I've kind of created two columns ultimately where we kind of look at uh, the economic framework, which is, in essence, I would say, describes our current society. I was going to say our current malaise, but I think some people might not think of it as a malaise, but I do. But I mean, our current society, our current like kind of like world order and things is very much an economic framework. And I kind of juxtapose that against what an empathic or an empathetic framework could look like. And uh, again, just to talk through it, like, you know, the approach from an economic framework, I believe, and I have found to be largely opportunist. When you look at the development of, uh, like, you know, uh, capitalism, consumerism, the world in the way that we know it, I think it would be hard pushed for somebody to not see that opportunism is uh, a, a defining factor in how, like, you know, things are appropriated, decisions are made, resources are taken, uh, like, you know, that the world is this kind of unnatural balance that again very ironic that the countries that have the most natural resources are also the countries which are the world's poorest countries and countries that sometimes actually don't have any material resource are somehow the most uh the, the richest and the wealthiest nations which again can only speak to an opportunist approach underneath now in the empathic framework the approach is considerate from the beginning because what the eco the economic framework also does is it's a very linear approach all of the externalities that uh, you know that exist on the path to you making your product or making your decision or doing what it is are all by the by. They're not worth considering because ultimately, in this profit motive, it is only the business that you're doing and everything else kind of gets thrown out or, in essence, ultimately ends up on the on the balance sheet of the commons rather than of the person who is fulfilling or taking up this opportunity. And so to the next level, it's I would say that this that the economic framework is characterized by the businessman, the economic man, as we uh, in economic theory is even described, the economic man. And that economic man, if we were to kind of, again, I don't know how people would picture that in their mind. If you've got your eyes closed and you think, what does the economic man look like? I think for a lot of literature and for a long time, it was very much painted as a uh, the kind of the upper, upper crust Victorian fellow, like, you know, who uh, who can be very well played uh, by uh, by Charles Dance, who played a uh, Tyrion Lannister in <laughs> in uh, Game of Thrones, and he was also, I think, he was in Bleak House as well. He may have been uh, the, the 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 miserly money owner. He, he plays great in in uh, Dickensian stories, but that kind of hawkish money counting, like doesn't care about the emotions. Uh, again, Ebenezer Scrooge kind of character is actually. Although that we look in stories and we sometimes go like, look at this bad guy, he's actually the the pedestal guy of this era that we live in, because ultimately, I mean, yeah. although that you know uh, the the directors and the, the CEOs of J.P. Morgan, BlackRock, you know Vanguard and these other groups know how to be with their PR management and like you know uh, narrative manipulation, they know how to present far nicer than Ebenezer Scrooge, but ultimately they're the same people. <laughs> Because it's all about, uh, you know, farming off externalities to other parts of the world so that we can maximise profit in our kind of like little space. However, that characterisation of a being, like, you know, from an empathic point of view, is like, you know, is, is also non-gendered. It's just an empathic being. 
an empathic being, like you know, one of which I would say is uh, the fungus in its many different guises, because fungi uh, they exist not to be of themselves, but to support their ecosystems in a way that, although like you know, the the, the empathy in the natural world is hard to sometimes like, humanize or characterize into how we would see things. I think if we were to take a more animist view of the world that we have around us, we would appreciate that you know that that there are plants that there are uh, there are living beings fauna and uh, flora that actually do fulfill the criteria of being an empathic being because of the role they play in making their whole ecosystem thrive rather than just making like you know more of themselves grow and so yeah it kind of car carries on through that like, relationships in the economic mindset are transactional in the empathic that they're quite holistic problem solving in the economic mindset is as quick as you can whereas in the empathic mindset is as long as it takes and so then the outcomes of as quick as you can are fiercer competition and we have now become the only animal and in fact the only living thing that like you know we have convenience central to our living philosophy convenience like is not anything that exists in nature it's why it's taken four and a half billion years to get here convenience is the shortcut and shortcuts don't serve us in the long run whereas the outcome of doing things as long as it takes in the empathic framework is very much stronger community and compassion because you understand everybody else's story and so then the outlook from understanding everything is one of healing which can be infinite whereas the outlook in face of competition and convenience is terminal and zero sum as we see in the world around us so i mean i've kind of touched on some of like key elements of it but what i often kind of say to people is now try and imagine when you look at empathy through the economic lens which is i think what you in essence were touching on when you framed this uh monologue that i've gone on which is empathy has become a buzzword because that's what the economy and an economic mindset does to everything it turns everything into yeah. another commodity it makes it fit with inside of an economic system imagine if yeah. you looked at economy through an empathic system so now that we saw economy not as like you know i have to hoard so that you there's so there's uh, unnatural scarcity but again we create to thrive we create to respect boundaries and actually we will find that there is enough resource and there is enough for us actually all to thrive without like you know needing like you know one person to be like, you know up here another person down there something that i learned on my travels actually uh in sweden and, and in scandi countries at large they have a principle which is called lagom uh, and this principle of lagom which is like you know speaks to even how they view society in, in sweden is this idea that if you have a jug and there are six glasses that first time you pour and you make sure that all of the glasses get the same there isn't an idea that one glass gets a load and another glass gets a little. The idea is that at any given point, what you're meant to be doing with the resource that you have is making sure that every single person who's part of, or every person or everything that's part of said resource story gets their equal and fair share. And that actually what they look to and like, you know, what is meant to be uh, a sign of great character and of a great uh, model citizen is the ability to embody that principle of Largon, that making sure that when you share, that you can share equally. Now, that, you know, that, like, you know, again, as capitalism's tentacles kind of continue stretching out, does begin to, uh, to, to dilute. But I find that, like, you know, when you go and visit Scandinavian societies, you do find, like, you know, that you're able to, I suppose, see that a lot clearer than I have definitely felt in the, the, the Anglosphere. Yeah, I think what you set out there is a, is a model is is very compelling and remarkably i can i can see it working straight away because there's a lot of things that just intuitively feel right and it's joined up i wanted to go back to you uh as you were just talking about the empathic being and talking about fungus i any excuse to talk about fungus i love because i well i read uh merlin sheldrake's book entangled life I might have mentioned that before but that that was really mind expanding in in just the role of how that works under a forest floor how certain plants support other plants that are sick and it sends things out and it helps them and it you know sends those nutrients out and but when you were talking about characterizing it in an emp empathic being we were you were talking about the archetypes that might exist as the businessman i wondered if you had an example of a character in literature or as a sort of hollywood archetype that would get anywhere close to 
an empathic being that you were talking about is there anyone out there that you feel is manifesting that in any way uh, well i have to say that recently i've been watching shows like billions and uh, <laughs> like uh as you can imagine almost antithetical to uh to that principle however uh i think that like you know films that have really resonated with me uh uh in recent years or I, and actually across my life and one that i even like name checked in a conversation yesterday a film's actually like uh pocahontas uh and then even avatar more recently uh because i think the the a character which uh, is in both, but I mean, in different, slightly different guises, is a central tree, a tree of knowledge, a tree which is actually part of the community. Uh, and in the Pocahontas story, again, I mean, this is like now back in the 90s that uh, came out, but I would say that's actually probably the one and only time that Disney have created an, an animist uh, song as their lead song, Colours of the Wind by Judy Kuhn which is an amazing song if you take the time to listen to the lyrics, which is, again, about taking time to, like, you know, can you paint with the colours of the wind? And it's just this idea that our senses, like, you know, again, within the economic framework, that we've kind of siloed them, that we see what we see, we hear what we hear, we smell what we smell, you taste what you taste, and that is it. Whereas, actually, there's this idea that... Uh, that things that we kind of maybe see or we don't see, like you know, like the wind and the river, can you, you should be seeing them as brothers and sisters, or maybe like you know the, the feeling of autumn can be like a, an, an aunt who comes to visit every now and again, and giving personification to to natural not only natural environments but natural mechanisms, like you know, it actually rem what happens when you go on that journey uh, is it kind of reminds you that we have bought into this story for a long time, this kind of dualist Cartesian idea of us being transcendent and above nature, when actually we are nature. We, we're literally made of the same elements and atoms. We are literally the same proportion of like water to solid as the earth is. And it's kind of sometimes, it takes a, a moment to step back. And I think that's why I say that the two trees, the tree in Avatar uh, and the tree in Pocahontas, they both just kind of remind me that conversations that we should be having with nature, like, you know, I grew up laughing at Prince Charles for talking with plants, whereas now it's probably the only idea within the monarchy that I agree with. <laughs> so uh, it makes you think to yourself, like, how do we reframe how we see everything, really? Because the stories that I was told, or the stories that I was led to believe through like, you know, my education and through growing up, are actually things that as I've got older, I've had to, in essence, unlearn because they speak to only one perspective. And again, that economic framework, and that economic framework doesn't allow for us to recognize the, the personhood of our natural environment around us, which deserve the same respect as we do. I think you're, you're touching on so many fascinating ideas there. Um, but what is central to this are, are the narratives that surround us. And I think just to go back to talking about the trees, one of my interests is old fabrics and tapestries and things that appear a lot is the tree of life. And it's a very, obviously a very symbolic thing. And it's a beautiful thing to see. And it's, it's celebrated in, in just this, this history. And, uh, and, I, and I think what you're saying is, you know, again, the education system for all the good that it's done it's made us very myopic as well. It's and and I think it's dislocated us from nature in many ways. I think there is a huge scientific bias that we have to live with. That's sometimes how I see it. And there are people who haven't been through formal education who have taken who who I who who you meet who are you know just people who have spent more time with nature and the wisdom that just almost comes from osmosis and from as you say watching the seasons what you can learn from that watching the wildlife and i think that for me uh there's almost more inspiration and one of the and one of the things i often talk about and this is trying to bridge back to the 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 point you're making around uh the approach the opportunistic or the considerate or the businessman or the empathic being is i i i practiced kung fu for a very long time and there are forms in kung fu that you learn and i will maintain that i learned more about strategy 
from practicing forms and understanding movement and leverage and how the body works than I, well, yeah, I mean, there are certain texts within sort of strategy and things like that that are, are, are amazingly good. But that for me has been hugely inspirational. Sure. I mean, I was going to say that I think that what happens in formal education is we're started at, at data points and we refine that data into knowledge. I think that I find that people who have acquired that, you know, their experience outside of the formal education system, they begin at wisdom and then they refine that to insight, right? Because the natural world gives you everything you need. All of what we are learning in this kind of data knowledge matrix is all abstract. It doesn't actually really exist. Like none of it does. Like money yeah. is an idea yeah. and a game that we tell ourselves. Time yeah. is an idea yeah. and a game that we tell ourselves. But actually, like, you know, what those games create all of the fog that fill up our heads. And so you're right that when I've talked to different, like, you know, uh, uh, indigenous, like, not only leaders, but community members, uh, I've, like, you know, had the, the pleasure and the honour of uh, talking to the Mother Earth delegation and talking to some of the global grandmothers, like people like Grandmother Jyoti Ma from uh, Northern California and, and others, like, in literally every sentence that they utter, like, you know, this, like, wisdom, like, spills out that, I've seen in other like guises of life, people have spent like, you know, like six like months putting together teams to try and come up with a proposal PDF that in essence she can share in a sentence. And so it kind of just makes you realize that, like, you know, in the creation of the complexity of this game, similar to, I suppose, the concept in, in Inception, we in essence have like narrative architects around us who just keep on creating things that are a little bit too complex for us to break our way out of, when actually all of it's just a game in somebody else's dream. What we should be doing is out there actually connecting with like you know the trees connected but earthing every single day walking with our bare feet on like the, you know on the on the natural ground and remembering that yeah that we are electric beings with electricity that comes from the ground nikola tesla proved us and showed us that but his story was like kind of like you know shut down because it was about like you know revolutionary and radical like you know sharing of natural resources in a way that doesn't require like you know uh companies to hoard and like charge us for energy so i mean again uh, it's a whole other like you know like avenue down there but you're exactly right and it's what i feel that i've come to recognize wisdom and insight is there right in front of us in nature and is I've, what you've learned through kung fu through tai chi which i've also like you know experienced a little bit when i was younger understanding flow and understanding how you can become part of that flow this is some of the greatest work we can do yeah and i and i think if um you know, one of the things that I uh, think is really great about so many people adopting meditation, it has, it serves many purposes, but I think one of the things it does do is just sort of starts to tune everybody in a little bit more around like what's important. And if you start asking that, that question about what's important here, then you do start to discover the right things and those 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 right things are either more nutritious or, or more fulfilling and often you know it's got that provenance in nature so i think I, yeah i um we're well we're on this we're on the same page there definitely one last thing Jeremy, i'd say on that on the on the framework thing is it was an, an idea that i kind of crystallized the other day in the shower i mean i don't know about you but my best ideas are often crystallized either on the toilet or in the or in the shower like basically it's right we had we had we had suzanne on the last podcast she she gets hers in hot in her hot tub so uh i think this is this is something this is quite revealing about maybe some of the guests that we've got as well when you're a parent of uh two children who are like you know three and under it's probably the only time that you get to yourself on the toilet or in the shower <laughs> so in those moments like ah let's have a little think but anyway, so I was thinking that uh, a dangerous pastime, I know, but I was thinking that uh, it's about th these frameworks create iterations, like our human existence is about iterating and we keep on iterating. Now, what economic iterating does uh, or what I kind of like, you know, again, I'm only positing, I'm only speculating. But I thought when the first human, like you know, discovered or created the first like kind of propellant, like, you know, throwing a stone at like, you know, a saber toothed tiger. Do you think that he could have imagined like intercontinental ballistic missiles or no fly zones? Like no. Do you think that when Leonardo da Vinci was first like you know modeling the helicopter by looking at the wings of butterflies and birds, he could have like imagined like black hawks and chinooks? Like no. But that's what economic iteration does in a in a within a complex of scarcity. 
it, it weaponizes everything and it, it, it like it it doesn't yeah. see the beauty it sees how can we use this for greater economic expedience now if that framework was different like from the very beginning how can we use what we have just discovered like you know what our creative resources has kind of come out of our, our tap how can we use this for empathetic like embodiment is the question rather than for economic iteration just it doesn't over a hundred years a thousand years end up in superpower wars and, and, and war zones and greedy men fighting over like, you know, a few things and putting everybody else at the, at the brunt of it. And so I would say that evil isn't born. Evil is economically iterated and that people aren't actually inherently okay. evil. They're just really capable at fulfilling the roles inside of an evil environment, an evil system. Thank you for sort of giving an overview of the framework. How do you apply that? I mean, how do you use it practically in your work? How does it play out? Well, I have a lot of uh, advisory positions uh, with different companies, as I said, uh, a lot currently in global agricultural projects, which again, like, you know, I have an issue, as you may well imagine, with agricultural projects. And what I end up doing is trying to advise people how we can move those to become permacultural or horticultural projects in instead, because like monocultures don't really do well i mean all we need to do is look at the story of the cavendish banana like, you know which like is co under constant threat from uh any kind of like poison or any kind of uh, like alien flora getting uh, into the the growing network could actually kill all of the bananas because what's happened by monoculturing uh, the, the Cavendish banana, which is the, the popular banana that we all now know around the world, Fife, Del Monte, the, the, yeah, the banana. Again, I'd actually ask to tell people, look into this story because it is actually one, a really, like, you know, detailed story of colonialism, like, you know, the story of the banana, and particularly the Cavendish banana. But the long and short of it is that uh, there were, and there still are, like, you know, hundreds, thousands of varieties of bananas around the world. Bananas that serve different purposes, different flavours, different textures. But the story of the Cavendish banana and even how it has that name, which I think, if I remember rightly, was to do with it's the Duke of Cavendish, or with somebody of of, uh, of uh, aristocratic extraction from the UK who's involved in the story. I mean, this was a story. Funnily enough, this was shared with me when I was part of a panel uh, uh, at the Tate about the future of food a couple of years ago, and it was just extraordinary. I don't remember it all, but the long and short, which is why. I say to people, go and check it out yourself because it is there to be found. There are podcasts about it, but there is a really like, you know, interesting story as to how bananas around the world and traders of bananas in other like kind of locales were kind of pushed out of the market to make way for, in essence, what has become the, uh, a European dominated banana uh, and uh, a particular type. But the development of the Cavendish banana to become what it has, has meant that it has become like, very like, you know, weak from uh, a, 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 a DNA and an infection point of view. And so people who travel to now where they do a lot of the growing, there are such strict uh, rules around how you travel and you literally have to be like in like bio gear and everything has to be like sprayed clean because if you even bring by accident, like, you know, a little bit of a spore from another plant into like where the bananas are grown, it could like wipe them all out. But ultimately, uh, you know, they're grown wow. and these ones are produced the way they are because they're the ones that travel the best for transatlantic, like, you know, uh, maturing in, in transit so that they can be fresh. Yeah, because they put them to sleep, don't they? To uh, That's one thing I know about bananas. They get put to sleep and then they transport them. Look into it yourself because, yeah, how I've, how I've told the story was a bit of a, a mishmash, but there were some salient points in it that as I heard, I was like, wow, what a great, like, you know, way of storytelling, like, you know, through something that we all know and, like, you know, and love. But actually, again, as you can imagine, yeah. with something that becomes so monocultural, it actually has been stripped of so many of the nutritional values that it once had. The banana is basically as much a product as like a bag of Maltesers now. So in advisory on projects around uh, like, so especially in like parts of the world where I've got some projects involved currently in, uh, in India, in, uh, in West Africa uh, and in the Caribbean as well. But these are largely what happens is people uh, want to kind of like follow what, they've seen before. I mean, this is also like, you know, something that I'm sure has been discussed in the Sense Network as well, that if we keep on like, you know, like taking the lead of the generation before us, like how do we actually change? 
Like, you know, if we keep on going, well, this is what they did. Well, this is what they did. Like, you know, we end up like, you know, like thousands of years down the line doing things for tradition's sake, but actually not recognizing how they don't actually serve us anymore. And so I think mm. what has been a large part of my offering and how I apply that empathic framework in those scenarios is just kind of like uh, letting people know that I know that a lot of the world's big companies and projects that, uh, you know, have capitalized, like, you know, greatly in the last couple of decades, even in the last century. It isn't to say that what they're doing is right. They've just made a lot of money. We have to be now looking at, like, you know, not to be first in market, but how can we be best in market? And I think that's just a different approach yeah. that people, like, you know, slowly but surely are kind of coming around to. Like, I mean, obviously, I'm aware that for me to kind of still get these uh, opportunities, I can't kind of uh, throw commerciality out, like, totally, like, as much as I may want to. But I say to people, like, if we are going to continue, like, you know, doing transactional business, how can we at least make sure that those transactions are win-win for all parties involved? And not only the parties who are involved in the negotiation, but also the parties of the environment in which that negotiation happens. Because that's all that's so often, like, you know, the, 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 the unspoken that, I mean, it is that which has created the global south. It is people having discussions and yeah. like, seeing everybody in the environment within which they make those deals as expendable or seeing them as, yeah, externalities only. Whereas for me now, like on these projects, it's yeah. like how can we, using even some of the new technology that we have available, making sure that for every thousand acres, say, that we're looking at doing planting and growing, that we create like uh, an educational resource or like, you know, an ideas lab how do we use like the byproducts of whatever it is that we're growing using new 3D printing technology to create things like hempcrete or creating other kinds of like, you know, like natural concrete like uh, like product that can be used in like, you know, the, the development and building of like homes and structures in the future that don't have so much of a strain on the environment, so much less water use and can actually also be part of uh, a carbon sequestering or bioremediation strategy. And so it's kind of things like this that, again, although that they are not my speciality, I don't have a, a botanical or an agronomist background or career. It's just about having, again, the empathy for not only myself and the other like, human stakeholders, but for the environmental stakeholders in any conversation and making sure that whenever any of these discussions have been progressed, that at any given point, like, you know, I'm just like, let's slow the roll. Have we thought about all of this? Yep. Let's slow the roll. Have we thought about all of this? And it's having someone in the room to say, like, you know, that saying, like, you know, if you want to go, if you want to go uh, fast, go alone. You want to go far, we go together. And I say to people, if we want to go far, we need to slow down. I think it's a really powerful framework. And, and my takeaway is there's like a set of provocations there that help whoever you're collaborating with to, to see things differently and ultimately think differently. And that's, you know, that's certainly what we're all about. But I can I can see in that framework, they are different lens that you can hold up. And you say, what well, you know, what if we stop seeing it like this? And what if we started to see it like that? And I just don't think there's, there's enough of that. As you say, we, you know, so, so often we are just sleepwalking into the future and not really taking that, you know, almost, almost zombified at times, you know, so maybe slightly high on sugar and and sort of or you know just kind of sucked in by social media and i think it is that time you know i think there's one theme that's sort of emerging here for us is just that kind of just re-engage with nature and start to ask some questions about what's going on and that's at every level at an individual level and also at a systemic level as well and 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 so i was just gonna i was just gonna kind of throw another question in and to sort of ask what a what's your what's your sort of latest mm -hmm. project that you're that you're working on i think if you've got a, a book project in the offing yes uh i mean actually got a few but there's one that i'm particularly focused on at the moment because uh it intends to be uh a global and a communal project although that i am penning the the beginning it's ultimately a story for all of us to tell, which again, I think very much like, you know, like dovetails and nicely kind of ties up my philosophy and like kind of how I think uh, of, of much of this, that everybody's story needs to be told and not everybody. And again, even that I have to keep on saying everything, everybody, every, like, you know, we all are on life's ledger, not just human, humans and humanity. And it's, it's, I think one of the hardest things that I've had to unpick 
is this Cartesian dualist view that we humans sit above everything else, that we are like, you know, not animals too. Like, you know, that when I refer to like humans and the animals, like, no, we're also animals. It's just non-human animals. Like, you know, we like, and I think that hubris is what's also allowed us to kind of like t uh, take up the drawbridge around ourselves in how we look at the world around us when actually we need to let that back down and remember that, yeah, that we are also part. And so to that point, yes, I've kind of conceived and been working on a new project, which uh, has actually been like since me going vegan. So actually five years in the making and it's called Children of Earth. Uh, the reason why I've called it Children of Earth is to that point, because it's the only way that I can remember that every single thing like, you know, on Earth was is, is, is from here. Like we're all just from here. Like, you know, these ideas of. Uh, of nationhood or these things belong to these people those belong to these like nothing belongs to anybody I mean I've also kind of been reading books about moving from ownership models to stewardship models which is kind of how we always should have been seeing things the stewards yeah. rather than owners and I think that has also kind of helped me like you know frame this idea but what children of earth is actually about is telling stories that change the narrative it's as a father as I said of to infant children I have been reading bedtime stories like every night now for a couple of years and obviously during lockdown like you know bedtime like you know storytelling was up to an hour and a half per night like, you know like lucky lucky girl uh, <laughs> but uh, what I was starting to find difficult was as I was reading the books and even sometimes thinking oh you're gonna love this one from daddy's childhood like you <laughs> you go back to read books of your own childhood and you're like what is this like what are we putting into the minds of children like <sighs> like um i think one of the first things that struck me was that in every single book very innocently maybe maybe not like it's this idea that we get food from the shop we don't get food from nature we don't get food from outside mm -hmm. we get food from shops and so from the very beginning we are bypassing our natural and organic relationships to create commercial relationships in the minds of our children. And I was like, this is not on. Like, how do we expect a new generation to, like, you know, like, you know, fight the climate battle to untether themselves from, like, you know, hydrocarbons and oil and all these things when we tell them the same stories that their favourite toys that they get are all diggers and, and like, and all... Uh, and every and every single thing is again geared towards how are you going to fit into the uh, into the economic system, and so I conceive Children of Earth as uh, first of all a, a kind of a publishing house which would create new literature which kind of unpicks whether or not it unpicks but it tells stories in new animist ways in ways that actually you know allows like you know uh, the the natural world to like, you know, revel in its agency rather than be seen as resources only. Even that term, natural resources, like, you know, it's just, it's, it's really quite, quite horrible. Like it's, it's seeing things as 2D and only for our use as opposed to like, you know, natural life. And so it was about how can we start changing like these words, the importance of the iteration of language back to that kind of, like, you know, that evil isn't born, it's iterated. Our language is also iterated. And what I find in the Anglosphere particularly is we have a language of classification rather than a language of, of community. Like, you know, how we even use pronouns and how we use these different things that speaks to how we put things into boxes. And if they don't exist in boxes and silos, we don't understand them. But it also as well speaks yep. to, like, you know, stuff like love. In the English language, we literally have that one word. And it's the same love that we use when we say, I love baked beans on toast. I love my mum. Like, you know, I love, like, Manchester United. <laughs> like, uh, not me personally, just say, using those as examples. And it makes you think, well, this is how ideas, even like love, can become diluted because we don't actually, like, even understand, like, you know, what these things mean when we use words so flippantly or, like, you know, so carelessly. And so it was like, how do we dial those things back? How do we tell stories to our children? And not only in English, but in every language. Or how do we bring different stories to the fore? like ones that maybe should be celebrated at the expense of others. And so the idea at first for me began with, I actually penned, uh, I penned a children's book already called Children of Earth. Uh, it's a kind of a short poem story, which is kind of highlights all of the things that we should be seeing as our siblings, like, you know, as fellow children of Earth. Uh, but then I've also been working on a book called It's Raining Corn and Quinoa. 
Now, the concept of that book is like we have so many terms of phrase, idioms, expressions, like it's raining cats and dogs. And we kind of use like animals and we use the natural world as kind of the butt of so many of our jokes. Like, you know, when we're not like, you know, making pig's ears of stuff or swinging cats out of bags and all of these kind of like sayings that they do have, like, you know, funnily enough, because I did, I've gone on quite a research journey to understand where a lot of these sayings come from. And they, like, you know, they come from real experiences, but they come from real experiences in the 1200s, the 1300s, the 1500s, the whenever, and we have evolved past that, but yet we still use language and tropes from the past and we kind of like bring those forward. What I am suggesting with this concept is how can we kind of globally, with tongue in cheek as well, because again, this is no finger wagging project. I just want people to also be able to have a laugh and think to themselves like, where does that saying come from? Why do I want to kill two birds with one stone? Why do I want to swing a tiger by its tail? Why do I, where, where do all these things come from? Why do we say this? Why can't we say things which actually, as you said, yeah, give animals or give the world, give everything some agency. So this is how the project was born. Now, as I said, it began with me writing a couple of uh, books myself. Uh, but as I kind of started sharing it and talking to other people, like I recognized and I had from the beginning that this is not my story to tell. But, you know, this is just me giving my couple of examples, but this is actually meant to be something which is global. I want everybody to kind of be inspired by an idea of, let me take the moment to think about the words that I use, the things that I say, like what do they actually mean in context? How can I change that for the better? And how can my personal iteration of language do something to heal the, even the social fabric of society? Yeah. I would say that a lot of the problems that we have in our society are down to, like, you know, how language and how different of us see language, like, you know, is falling down. I think there's a great quote from, uh, from Khalil Gibran, if I can remember, it's like, uh, between the things that we mean and don't say, and we say and we don't mean, is where most of love is lost. And that love is not only a romantic love, but also, like, you know, a social cohesion I, I understanding yeah. of love and community. And I think that if we were to better iterate language, to better understand each other, to better understand each other, even across language barriers, we would come a lot closer to solving some of these massive, like, you know, transnational wow. problems that we have as societies and actually be able to forge real communities and communities of difference. Putting, putting some unity into community. Exactly. Common yeah. unity. So at the moment, like, yeah, where I am at with it now is it's kind of developed to be, it's starting to morph into becoming like a, a, a DAO, uh, in the kind of Web3 world, because Web3 protocols also offer a lot of what would be required to make a project like this grow. It is that it's based around a set of p uh, purposeful principles but that anybody can join and that everybody can, like, you know, be part of it and that there is no ownership, that anybody who, like, you know, puts in, like, you know, it is also yours. It is meant to be for all of us. So just for those people that, those people listening who they heard you use the word DAO, and we're not talking about an Eastern philosophy, we're talking about decentralized autonomous organizations. Could you, could you just do a brief definition of that and why it's important to this project? Because I think this is this is a, a, a really great idea. No, sure. Well, DAOs, yeah, as you've really, yeah, quite uh, rightly illuminated uh, and illustrated there, is this new, I mean, we say a new concept, but it's kind of at least been uh, popularized more recently. Uh, and this is uh, how organizations are set to take structure in this new Web3 world. And again, if you're not sure what this Web3, Web2 world idea is, Web2 is where we are now, which is kind of everything uh, based on platforms. We have these big platforms, your Instagram, Google, Facebook, Meta, and we are all an audience. We're all audiences on these platforms, like, you know, some of us are maybe the, on the pedestal with audiences below us, but ultimately our content and everything is still owned by the platform and how we communicate is to an audience, one to many. What Web3 and this new idea of how the internet is going to evolve is that it will be decentralized. And in that decentralization, uh, it will mean that there are no longer audiences in the same way, but more communities because things will not be passive. It will require interaction. It will, and, and in fact, value will be found from your interaction regardless of whether or not you're technically adept or, or in, in other ways that you may see or find yourself lacking in this Web2 world. Just the fact that you're part of the community is like, you know, a, a large, like, you know, a, a large step towards your community involvement. 
So we're in this Web3 world, this decentralized world uh, as well, where community is, is central. Like the future of the organization is, yeah, as uh, you've said, a decentralized autonomous organization. Or again, actually, depending on which group you're working with, because I've been working with a protocol uh, on the Telos blockchain called Seeds, and they've created uh, decentralized holonic organizations, which is pronounced do, D-H-O, rather than D-A-O. And uh, a holon, uh, the, or the idea of a holonic organization, is also the fact that you are still like a whole, but your whole is only part of a larger whole. Uh, and that by creating all of our little holes within the larger whole, we actually make the ecosystem thrive even better. Back to that natural environment, like, you know, an uh, allegory or analogy, each plant, like, you know, grows in its own, like, you know, genus, its own way, but together they create the forest floor. But the forest floor is one thing, even though all of these different yeah. plants make it up. So you are still an individual, or you do still have, like, you know, agency in your in your own right within it, but it's only because you're part of the greater thing. So back to the yeah, DAOs within that as well, all of it is the key word in it, is the decentralized because by things being decentralized it means that the power doesn't like you know bit by bit accumulate and we end up back in that economically iterated tower where a few people at the top make decisions for everybody by developing organizations and developing how we interact with each other in the future of community uh, as laterals rather than as verticals it means that nobody becomes lofty and like far away from us but everybody come oh is only as far away as we want to hold out our hands to the people next to us and so I think that, yeah, it offers a lot of promise. Yep. Don't get me wrong, there are bad actors in the space already, but the space is very nascent still. And I think that there are actually far more good actors and the principles that overarch this are good. And so I think that those bad actors will ultimately, you know, uh, be ushered to the, to, the, to the peripheries and actually some really strong, good ideas that bring people into the fold are actually going to permeate and kind of take root movements forward. How will that benefit Children of Earth? Because I think that's where you're about to, before I interrupted you, you were about to just sort of elaborate more. Uh, so how that will work for Children of Earth is what I kind of, or myself and others who I've then ended up talking to within lots of different DAOs and people who are now in these communities who are so much more in the spirit of, again, even looking at the empathic framework, the spirit of collaboration rather than the spirit of competition. People in this kind of like new DAO landscape are kind of happy to, you kind of give an idea, share an idea, they're happy to share feedback. And it doesn't become this kind of like, right, well, I'm going to have to charge you if you want to hear my thoughts on this, or I'm going to have to, people are, if you're working on something of purpose, let us help you. Like, you know, we all have a resource, let's kind of try and pull that together. And so it was actually having some of those conversations that people said, well, actually, what you could do here is you could create like Children of Earth as a creator's fund. Like, you know, using like, you know, DAO and Web3 technology, what you could do is, in essence, ring fence resources to allow or to, or to support and cultivate an environment of like, you know, organic storytellers from all around the world to push forward stories that have like, you know, long been pushed to the side because they don't fit into the economic model. How can we now bring back some of those others? I mean, a great book that I read recently uh, from a, an author, Jenny O'Dell, which is, I think it's like, you know, the, the, let me tell you, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy by uh, Jenny O'Dell. She talks about the usefulness of uselessness. Uh, and uh, that uselessness, though, is in obviously the eyes of the economic system. And, like, you know, people like myself, like, you know, who have fallen outside of it, the outliers, we are, to all intents and purposes, to the economic system, often seen as useless. But I would contend and I would hope that, you know, listeners would, would feel from, like, you know, the, as well, the pace at which I've been talking here this whole time. You would see that, like, you know, I've, I've stocked up a fair bit of uselessness in my time. Well, I just need to share this with you. Uh, I, it's, I'm not sure it's a Bible quote, but it sounds like one. But blessed are the cracked, for they let in the light. Uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't. I don't remember cracked in the King James version, but like you know, <laughs> we'll run with that. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, I think that like you know, the stories of those, the cracked, the 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 broken, the 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 useless, that has often been pushed to the periphery. Like you know, by bringing those back in, we actually are going to be able to like grow things that are far stronger and far more resilient. And I believe as well that you know the success matrix or the success metrics, sorry, that we uh, currently look at our world through are just so skewed. Like, you know, I would say that looking at, like, you know, uh, 
uh, people from some of the indigenous groups that I've had, again, the, the, the honour of being able to work with, who them and their people have really you know, lived and been able to maintain and thrive their local environment for over 10,000 years. In that time, they've seen Julius Caesar come and go. They've seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Ottomans come and go. They're about to watch, like, you know, like Western hydrocarbon come and go. And I'm like, I would contend that this is a story of success far more than a story of what's going on, like, you know, at Chevron or at Exxon. Those aren't stories of success. These are what we've convinced ourselves yep. is success through this financial metric. But actually, success is about longevity. Like, you know, again, success is looking at the sequoia trees, looking at the baobab trees, looking at like you know like members of our wider like you know again not society but our wider world who have lived through all of this and have somehow been able to continue telling stories all the way through i think that's where we should be looking and that is uh, a large inspiration I, I, for how we are going to tell stories through children of earth i really love that idea is there you know as you think about you know gathering stories is anything or could the sense network could we do anything with the sense network that would be helpful to this project for you yeah i mean ultimately i mean i'm a i'm very much a, a man of the people i mean i'm self self <laughs> self-proclaimed uh but what i mean by that is the the technical side of a lot of these things similar to as i was explaining with the uh botany and the agronomy sides of the bioremediation work is not my speciality but it's about making sure that these things are remembered in the conversation so I'm sure that across the network, there will be people who are far more uh, technically adept at maybe, say, you know, putting together stuff like building like, our websites and like creating like, literature to make sure that it travels the right way. As I said, when I think back to the example of me making that vegan shut up track for under £100 and actually having a whole load of fun while doing it, but then seeing that, you know, the strength of the idea and the strength of the content travel to over like 30 million uh, impressions and engagements. This lets me know that, like you know, that when you're doing these things and you're doing them right, like you know, the right people come on board. You can do things like you know, without it kind of like fitting into an economic framework. But actually, people want to take part because they believe in what it is that we're doing, and together we can do something great. I just believe that anybody who wants to be part of iterating language, part of making sure that you know that the world that they are going to inhabit in the future, their children, or even again, if you don't have it from such a myopic view, but just, you just want the world to be better, you want us to have better conversations. There is a role in what we're doing in Children of Earth yeah. for you. It's just about seeing it, having our conversation together, and then understanding how we can make our ecosystem thrive. Amazing. Well, Joel, I just want to say thank you for an amazing conversation. And I just think having this conversation is totally my... I've learned so much. You've got, you know, you totally... We often talk about mind expansion. You've given me some, certainly some mind expansion. So thank you so much for, for joining us today and i think we should uh we should set up a, a channel or a um a post on the on the sense network for you and see if there are some willing collaborators thank you like yeah so much as i said i, I feel that uh the, the funny thing about podcasts or kind of like timed conversations is that in my own mind i kind of set off a kind of stop clock of like right how much can i get into this amount of time and so i feel that maybe at points I've kind of like, I've, I've rushed through, I've kind of articulated a little bit quickly. I don't always talk so fast, but I look forward to us being able to have more conversations and I look forward to being able to interact with more people across the Sense Network as well. Ultimately, if there is anything to take from the yeah. stories that I think I've shared today is that my life has been about learning from other people and like, you know, not in necessarily the ways that people would expect that, you know, in a prescribed time and place that we sit down and we do like a workshop, but just chilling out with people, just being, just being. And just by being has actually been the greatest yep. reward. I totally agree. And, you know, maybe as a, a follow-up to this, if people have tuned in, we could maybe schedule like a an hour, like an almost like an ask me anything. Um, and, and people can rock up and they can listen if they don't want to take part and be passive or if people have got some big questions or some stories to share and get that conversation started that might be a really nice way of kick-starting it sounds amazing as i said anything that helps us all grow together like in that spirit of collaboration rather than competition ultimately we are the agents of our own future let's go and do it and that's why we're called sense worldwide thank you so much joel cheers jerry Thank you for listening to Extreme Perspectives, brought to you by Sense Worldwide. 
We'd love you to join the conversation using the hashtag Extreme Perspectives. If you enjoyed it, do leave us a review. The Sense Network collaborates with many of the world's most innovative companies to help them to be more innovative. Join us at thesensenetwork.com or get in touch via email. Hello at senseworldwide.com.